The Luminous Mind, episode 25. Does everybody deserve a choice? Yes. How do you give somebody a choice? You ask first. It's that easy. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness. Rather, light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is the author of May I Kiss You, a candid look at dating, communication, respect, and sexual assault awareness. And as the best host of the award-winning DVD, Help, My Teen is Dating, Mike Dorowitz is one of the most sought-after allies in the world for helping parents and educational systems provide preteen and teenagers with the how-to skills set for addressing dating, respect, and sexual decision-making. His clients include Princeton University, the U.S. military, and over 40 educational institutions each year. <laughs> Welcome, Mike. Thank you for joining the Luminous Mind. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Well, this is going to be a fun topic because um, this is probably something that's near and dear to the hearts of our parents that we work with. And so I were interested in <laughs> hearing your your message. First of all, I have to know how the Safe Date Project came about. Uh, we started the Date Safe Project uh, in the, back in 2002. I've been doing the work for around a little over a decade at that time, and we wanted to create an organization that could reach and live well beyond my speaking, my writing. And so that's how the organization got started, uh, was wanting to have a larger reach and be able to be able to spread the mission and the message with more people around the world. Well, how did you get interested in it then? Just... I be Yes, I became interested in work on a very personal level. I was a college student in 1989, when I received a phone call that one of my older sisters had been sexually assaulted. And oh, wow. I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was shell-shocked. I was emotional. And a little while later, months later, I would start to learn about sexual assault. The perpetrator was caught. There was going to be a trial. And I would have to ask myself when I looked at the definition of sexual assault, which was sexual contact without consent, I'd have to look in the mirror and go, well, consent would mean permission. Normally, to get permission, you need to ask. And right after that, I heard a speaker on our, on our campus talk about the issue of consent. And I realized, wait a second here. Um, if you're not asking, how do you know you have consent? And that started with me uh, looking myself in the mirror, asking myself that question. Then I went around to other people and said, hey, do you ask? And they said, no, you just go for it. And I said, wait a second. You just guess what you're doing with another person's body and that's okay? And people are like, well, yeah, that's what everybody does. And you start going, wow, how messed up is this situation? We're making the person defend themselves instead of giving them a choice. And that's where it all began. Wow. So what is your basic message then? Our basic message is really three main components we talk about. Number one, ask first. If you want to know what your partner wants to do, ask. If you think you're definitely sure what your partner wants to do, well, ask. They're going to say yes. <laughs> Some people say, well, I don't have to ask. I know what they want. Well, then good. You'll always ask, right? Because they're always going to say yes to what you think. Uh, they're like, That's well, kind of an arrogant attitude to just assume that they know what you want. <laughs> yeah. But what's amazing is most people have the arrogance because they were taught that's the romantic thing to do is to just read someone's mind. Even though we all know if you walk out on the street and say, hey, can you read someone's mind? People go, of course I can't. But yeah. somehow in romance, people make this crazy drawn out assumption that I know exactly what my partner wants. Look, you might even know that your partner's in the mood. You might get that read right. But knowing exactly what they want on a Tuesday night at 8 o'clock intimately, what they want at that moment, there's no way. It's a guessing game. And so you might argue, well, I guess right a lot. Well, that you <laughs> might, you might, but the times you guess wrong is a problem every single time. And it, your partner deserves to have a choice. Always. Exactly. What's your second message? You said ask first. What's the second? Ask first. Number two is that when you see someone at a party, a bar, a club, using alcohol to facilitate a sexual situation, in other words, setting up a sexual assault, how to intervene, how to stop that situation. So we give, when we're doing live presentations in our books and our DVDs, we give parents, we give teenagers the actual skill sets to do that. And then the third item is we teach people how to open the door so their children can come forward to them 
if anybody ever has or ever does sexually touch them against their will or without their consent. I was reading the last blog that you wrote about the bystander intervention. And, you know, that is probably every parent's worst nightmare to think of their son or their daughter. I mean, this case uh, especially was a son. You know, I have a lot of boys. That is just terrifying to me to think that, you know, going into a locker room could be a very unsafe situation for them. How do you, you know, as a parent, how do you prevent that situation? And if something like that happens, what do you do? So for everybody listening out there, what we're referring to right now, the case that you, Rebecca, are referring to. Yeah, go ahead and expound on it. (laughs) Yes, is a case that happened a few months ago uh, where a, actually several months ago now, a high school football team was sexually molesting, assaulting their teammates as part of a hazing process. And uh, because of that, it came forward and there were charges that were brought forward. And, and there so we should talked, have been. <laughs> absolutely. And so we talked about how that culture can even exist. Uh, how does that get to that place? Well, and so let's back up to your question now, which is how do you prevent that from happening to your child? Number one thing we have to understand with sexual assault, only one person has 100% control prevention of sexual assault. And that's the perpetrator. Yeah, exactly. So the only way we prevent that from happening is creating a culture where we say that is not acceptable by anybody at any means and help reduce the odds that anybody would not speak up if that happens, right? You look at a case like that. There were lots of players in the locker room, but so many either thought that was acceptable and or were too afraid to speak up because that behavior was not considered blatantly, obnoxiously wrong by the majority in the room enough that they would stop it. Well, well I, I love to say, well, what, what, what would they stop? Well, they would have stopped something uh, such as a murder. They would have stopped a, a physical maiming of somebody. Even though an assault is that, people don't put that in their mind, which is what's part of this is messed up. They would have stopped those things because they said that is too extreme. That is going too far. And sexually assaulting somebody should always be considered going too far too extreme. But our culture says doesn't say that. It says things like just making your move on somebody sexually in an intimate moment is acceptable. It says that, well, pushing the boundaries with your partner sexually is acceptable as long as you don't go too far. That's really messed up. Well, and I loved how you um, you related that situation to if that happened to a girl, you know, we wouldn't call it hazing. That would have been called sexual assault. And so if it happens to your son in the locker room, you know, we need to use the same verbiage to get that across to people. Yes. So, people say this is boys being boys. No, this is not something. No, that's that boys, way beyond that. <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, the whole concept of this is boys will be boys is just an excuse for violence. Exactly. And to even teach that boys will be violent, that's just how boys will be boys, is ridiculous. And it should be demeaning to all males out there. If you're a male and people say boys will be boys and somebody does something awful to another person who's a male or a female, we should all stop and go, why are we lowering the standard so poorly, uh, so low? And why aren't we saying, no, that's not boys will be boys or girls will be girls. It's always about what is the humane thing to do? What is the human thing to do? Not what's the manly thing to do or the womanly thing to do. What's the humane thing to do? So what groups do you usually target with your message? Uh, yeah, we speak with everybody. Uh, sixth grade and up is, is a really, really where we start. And when I say up, I mean up. So, for instance, we work with middle schools, high schools. We work with parents. We work with universities around North America. We work for the U.S. military all over the world. And I work with the U.S. military in that audience, you might have an 18-year-old, but you might also have a 55, 60-year-old. Exactly. And in the military audience, over half the audience is married. So in there, we're talking about sexual intimacy and marriage and the assumptions we make and how we need to be able to use our verbal skill sets to give our partners choices in marriage. Because some people go, why well, married? I don't need this. All right, let's talk about that intimacy in marriage. Do you ever just try something with your partner because you think they're in the mood? Well, of course, that's called marriage. Does your partner deserve to have a choice? Well, of course, I love them. Why aren't you giving them one? Yeah. You know, and so this applies to everybody. 
Well, and you hear a lot of you hear a lot of misconduct like that happening in in a lot of those situations in the military, like we talked about in locker rooms with with kids. And anymore, we have such a sexually open society that I guess everyone just assumes that that you know everyone's up for that. How do parents? Well, and that's a, that's an important point. We want to stop on there, Rebecca, which is you know people hear about this in the military and they think this is a military issue. Uh, the Huffington Post article I wrote before the one you're referring to was actually saying this is not a military issue. This is not a university issue. This is a cultural problem. Yeah. The reason we talk about it in the military and universities is that's because where we have people living together, closely together in confined places, universities, military. So it's able to show itself more uh, visually. We're able to see it because people report within the community. It's harder to see this on a community level when you talk about two 20-year-olds living in an apartment building. Nobody oversees that living style. And so it's very different than on a college campus or in a U.S. military. This is a cultural problem yeah. worldwide. And it's really important we all think. When I walk up to parents and say, have you taught your child how to ask for what they want and don't want intimacy? Parents will go, well, no, of course not. That, that, that's a little awkward and uncomfortable. And I go, Okay. Do you hope your child always has a choice before somebody ever touches them sexually or intimately? They go, well, of course I do. Okay, well, how are they going to have a choice if you aren't teaching them how to ask for what they want or don't want? And then you see parents go, whoa, yeah, that's a good point. If I want them to be given choices, shouldn't I be teaching them to give their partner choices and to expect that kind of choice for themselves in any moment they're in sexually intimately? With talking about your kids, you know, you have a couple of books. You have May I Kiss You, A Candid Look at Dating and Communication, and then The Sexual Assault Awareness. How do you go about, or wait, or The Help My Teen is Dating? Those both sound like fantastic books to help parents teach their children on what should we be teaching our children about sexual intimacy? Well, thank you. About I appreciate that. And they, the one wonderful thing about the books is how they both came about. And that is, May I Kiss You came about because people were saying, hey, what you're teaching us at these sessions, is there a way we can take this home? Students were saying that originally, or teachers. And we would say, you know what, we just need to put it down in writing. And so that book came out in 2003. Uh, we're very grateful for the response. It continues to get 12 years later now, still used by what it was interesting is we'll get High school students, college students who will say, well, I read that in one night and it's totally changing how I've dated. But we also get people who are literally a few months ago, I had a gentleman who was in his 50s who got remarried about two years ago. He asked his wife, now wife, the first time that they dated for a kiss. She said, yes, they always remember one. And to this day, they still ask each other for intimacy. And he shared with her that he learned that from the book. He was an administrator at a university where I speak at. And he started reading the book and saying, I'm a single person. I need to be doing the right thing at my age. And so it's really neat to see whether you have a 14-year-old or a 55-year-old saying, these are skill sets we need. Now, that's the all in the May I Kiss You book. To help my teen DVD, that was parents who would come here and say, you know what? I'm at your session, but my spouse isn't here. My partner's not here. Is there a way I can take this home to them so we can have this conversation with our teens on the same page? Not you have the talk or I have the talk, but we have it on the same page. And that's how the DVD Help My Teen is Dating got started and it was produced. Well, and we have a lot of parents that teach their children or trying to teach their children about um, staying abstinent before they get married. How do you suggest that children communicate? How do you suggest, I guess, how parents can help their children communicate those goals and values for themselves, especially in our culture where, you know, that's really almost frowned upon? Well, and it's interesting because in our culture, uh, as you just said, it's almost frowned upon. We have to show a skill set that can work for whatever belief system those parents have is what we teach. So what's neat about our work is that we have parents who absolutely believe in teaching abstinence who love our approach because it works. We have parents who say, I want to give a more comprehensive education to my children. And they say, and this works because it's all about honoring somebody's boundaries. Mm -hmm. So when parents say, well, I want my kids to wait. Well, then you want to make sure your child has just as much information as the parent who is saying, I want my kids that if they make this choice right now to be intimate, that they know everything they need to know. 
both parents should actually be giving all the same amount of information. Yeah, knowledge is power. <laughs> That's right. Because the, it's shown, the evidence shows that the child who has more information makes better choices because they understand the whole picture. What you'll tend to sometimes see is parents who say, well, if I give them all the information, that's going to entice them to be more intimate. Uh, no, they're already having urges. Yeah, you know? it's it's part of your natural. I mean, it's how God makes you up. You know, that's you have correct. those urges and desires and, and we've got to learn how to communicate those and be able to, you know, keep those under check and all of those things. Right. And so. the more bad you make it sound, the more you lose your child's ear. Like you might have your child's ear when you sit down, and have the talk with them, like they might listen fully and be engaged. But when they leave that conversation, whether it be in a month or six months or a year from later, and one of their friends becomes sexually active and says, I don't know why your parents told you that. It's wonderful. It's amazing. You lose. Because in the end, if your child keeps hearing from everybody else positive examples and you only gave negative, they're going to think, well, either way, I'm getting bad information. So I'm going to go somewhere in between and think this must be somewhat okay. And you lose. And when you give your children all the information, which is this is a gift, this can be a wonderful, glorious experience. It can be if everything's in place, you're making this at the right choice with the right person in the right situation. You teach all of that, then the child understands, okay, my parents do understand it's wonderful, but they also understand it can go very wrong yeah. very quickly. And well, so I want it to be the wonderful, joyous gift. So I want to make the right choices. Well, and I love how you talked about if you teach your children that it's bad, because I think sometimes that can, I mean, even if they did wait until they're married and they, uh, they abstain, then there's always a mental breakdown of like them feeling like they're doing something bad versus it being, like you said, a glorious gift. And so does your books talk about that then of how to talk about that, where it's a wonderful gift and, and so that, in the the DVD, which is for parents, focused on parents, does have a section on faith and how you integrate faith into, the, into this discussion. And there it absolutely goes into that direction. Great. And here, Because you're right. The stigma that, that is left behind on couples who are raised with intimacy is bad. It is amazing how many partners, it may only be one of the two in a relationship, that are married 20 years and one of them still can't feel sexually free or still feels guilty for wanting to be sexually assertive. In our culture, we tend to see this a lot more uh, more so, we see it with both genders, but even more so with females yeah. who have been taught that somehow sex is bad and they they can never be totally free with their partner, which takes away the gift. And that that's well, and unfortunate it, for anybody in any relationship of any gender, of any orientation. And I think it would, it would be a detriment in their relationship, you know, that they can't have that full that full feeling of being completely open and, you know, enjoying the whole process with their spouse. And I, and I wonder too, if, if you have that mindset, if you do end up in a situation where there is a lot, a lot of resentment with sexual, you know, the sexuality between couples within marriage, do you find that? Well, and yeah, what's interesting is when you work with older, older audiences, you have people say, well, you know, I once tried to ask you, my partner said they don't know what they like, and we've been married 15 years. And so you pause and go, okay, then you need to slow down and say, let's figure it out. Let's talk it out. Let's see what you don't like. What's... And you need to help each other learn how to sexually communicate because you were never taught it. Yeah. And so what <laughs> happened was at 18, you started being intimate by just doing what you do. Well, what happens 20 years later? You just kept doing the same thing because... One of you or both of you might have thought it's, you're not supposed to talk about it. And, and you lost 20 years of one, what could have been so much more wonderful intimacy and really honoring the gift for what it can be. And people get it when you talk about it. They're like, this is so true. And then when people do figure it out, whether it be later in life, and they'll say, it's a shame it took me those 20 years. I should have had this skill set at 18. Because if when I engage in this intimacy with my partner, we should have been able to treat it like the gift it was. So yes, you see this at, at all age levels. Wow. Before we go on, let us take a minute and hear about our sponsors. Hey, Firestarters. This is Mark, producer of The Luminous Mind. If you're like me, the thought of going out to the store and shopping is enough to make you want to crawl in a hole and hide. If that's you, then do your shopping online through Amazon. Just go to theluminousmind.net, click on the Amazon link, and shop away. Also, most of the books and resources that Rebecca and her guests discuss can be found on our Amazon links as well. 
Again, if you're like me, you have already accidentally signed up for Amazon Prime. So most of those purchases should have free shipping as well. Good luck! Welcome back to The Luminous Mind with Mike and the Date Safe Project. So what are some successes that you've seen with spreading your message? Well, you know, some of the most powerful ones, uh, I mean, we have had some unique ones where people say, we met at your show. We asked, (laughs) yeah, we went on a date. My partner asked me because we were at the show together. And to this day, we're still asking and now they're married. Oh, wow. Uh, We've had those kind of experiences. We've had people who come up to us and say, hey, I saw you three years ago totally changed all of my relationship sense. And I ask every single time, and I teach my partners, if you're going to be into with me, ask first. Don't make assumptions with my body. And what's really neat is how many people realize, now that I'm asking, how sexy and passionate asking is. Because people have this perception that it's contractual, like, may I kiss you now, versus, hey, I'm having a great time. Can I kiss you now? You know, or whispering your partner's ear, may I give you a kiss? And it can be fun and flirtatious, but they realize that when they start to actually implement the strategies they're being taught for healthy, respectful intimacy. So what are some long-term goals that you have for your project? Well, our goals, we still have a long ways to go because our goal is to create a world that has a culture of consensual sexual intimacy. And while... We're thrilled every time we hear one of the success stories, like the ones we just mentioned out there. And and we're thrilled every time after one of our live programs in a school, school students come up to us and say, this totally changed how I'm going to be in my relationship from now on. Those moments are incredible. And at the same time, we know we still have millions of people to reach. And so it's a matter of getting to more schools, more parents, more communities, more military installations as we continue to try to transform the culture to where we need to be. So speaking about the changes, I mean, how would you like to see the world change in the future? Well, one is how we talk about sex. Uh, One example would that be is one, it's extremely heterosexual in conversation. People like to say boyfriend, girlfriend, or boys should do this and girls should do that. And they assume when they're saying that, that the other one is with somebody that is of not the gender they are. Uh, And so those are the kind of things that we need to be more inclusive. We need to stop taking gender roles And instead of reinforcing them, we need to remove them. And I spoke a little bit about that earlier, but I'll speak a little more about that now, specifically what I mean by that. When somebody says, for instance, the man should pay for a date, why? Well, you know, that shows that he cares. Oh, so financial payment is how he shows respect and appreciation for somebody. Because, you know, it's interesting. If you go to somebody and say, do you want somebody to pay to be with your daughter on a date? or be with your son on a date, most people go, of course not, that's prostitution. But yeah, you just told your child, make sure you pay for the date. And so do you see the conflicting message yeah, here? Yeah, I've actually heard boys say that, that you know, if they're going to pay for a date, they're expecting some return for that. That's exactly correct, because what were they taught? Your job as the male is to pay. So then he thinks, well, if my job's to pay, then my partner's job is to reward me for pain. And that the concept is that reward is intimacy. And by the way, we hear it from both sides. In other words, we hear the partner who's on the date and the other person's pain. And they think because the other person's pain, well, the least I can do is give them a kiss. After all, they paid for everything. So they've also been taught by society, if somebody spends a lot of money on you, you know, you might owe them a little something, which Uh. is awful, a horrible message. I never really thought about it. How it's... I see this in middle school students. They'll buy each other gifts. And I'll say, why in sixth grade are you buying somebody a gift who is one, the boyfriend, girlfriend thing alone is a problem in sixth grade potentially. Uh, But why are you buying each other? Well, you know, that's what you do when you're in a relationship. You, You pay for things. And they, at age 10, 11, and 12, they were telling me this. Oh, wow. Yes. And if they believe it at 12, what do you think's happening at 20 when they actually have some money? and at 30 and at 40. So removing these gender roles and stop saying this is what a a good man does or what a good woman does. Look your child in the eye and say, being a good person means you respect your partners at all times. You deserve to be respected at all times, which means you deserve to always have a choice. And you wanna take away money 
out of relationships. So when you go on a date with somebody, let them know, hey, you know what? Uh, you asked me on a date. That's so awesome. Thank you. The least I can do since we're going to have a great time is pay my way. That's the least I can do. So how about I, I do that? I'll take care of mine since you asked me on the date. I'll pay my way. You pay yours. And it takes away all that stress. Is that cool? And you have a fun way by doing that of setting up this new paradigm. Yeah. And if, you're, if your date says, no, I have to pay, say, well, look, I, I really would be uncomfortable with that. And if, if I hope you'll honor that I want to do my part, you'll do your part, and we're okay. If you don't want to honor that, then this probably isn't going to work out. And teach kids right away. You deserve to be respected and for them not to bully over and say, no, I'm going to pay for everything. Uh, now, I understand that we're in a culture that says if you ask somebody out, it's expected that you pay. And, we're, and so it makes it hard for some people to say, look, would you like to go on a date? Uh, is it okay if we pay half and half because I don't want money to be a problem? Uh, some people get very uncomfortable with that. Yeah, and I've actually heard that that can be kind of a turnoff to girls. Because our I mean, culture's taught that, that's which is what really sad. Taught. It's really sad. But what somebody could do is open the door and go, look, I understand that our culture says, you know, I understand everybody says if you ask out, you pay. And if you would like that, I'm happy to do that. I don't want to make that assumption that you want me to, to do that. So you just let me know what you're comfortable with. If, you're, if you'd like me to pay, I'm happy to do that. Would you like that? If not, we can each, you know, half, half take money out of the equation, whatever you like. Once again, that takes a little bit more skills taught because our culture, it goes against our cultural norms. Well, and, and I think part of your message sounds like you teach that, like you said, that we have respect for, for all people. You know, I was always taught that the guy opens the door for the girl and stuff, but then I see women that are just very extremely disrespectful to men and they expect like, well, they can trample all over him, but as long as he opens the door for me or, you know, whatever, you're just kind of teaching a, a message. It sounds like of, of mutual respect where we communicate well and we ask each other questions about, you know, our sexual intimacy, but then we also, we don't want to allow ourselves to be victims or to, to have that victim mentality of like, you can do whatever you want to somebody if they don't, you know, if they don't follow these rules of etiquette type, type of situation. Is that? Yeah. So the key word is mutual, mutual respect, mutual choices. That's really the key word. So for instance, if you want to open the door for somebody, that's fine if you open the door for everybody because you believe it's a nice thing to do for everybody. If you only open the door for one gender, what are you implying about that gender? That somehow you're stronger and you're going to be the, the protector and you're going to open the door for that person. But if you say, if I'm the first one at the door, I'm going to open the door because that's a nice thing to do. You do it for everybody. And yeah. many of us out there do, right? We still believe in opening the door because you're at the door, you open the door for somebody. But running in ahead and opening the door because you have this role to be the protector. People go, well, that's nice that a guy does that for a girl. Well, it's nice for anybody to do that for another person. Yeah. And so, and also it's nice for a guy to do that for a guy, for a girl to do that for a girl. Take away those assumptions once again. So yes, it's mutual respect. It's really an important word. Well, and like you said, that if you're doing something for somebody hoping to get, I, mean, I guess we need to take that stigma out of our out of our culture somehow. If you're doing something nice for somebody hoping to get something in return, and that's kind of where a lot of things go awry in a way, right? That's correct. And that's why the only thing you would look to get in return typically when you do something nice for somebody is the joy of knowing you did something nice for somebody. And that, that is the greatest gift. That, that's such a great gift in itself, right? So when somebody's doing it for any other reason, and by the way, the number one reason you do all those things is to impress. You do it to impress the other person, which means it's not about respect. People go, well, no, you should do that because that's a respectful thing to do. That's not why they're doing it. If you really look at it, they're doing it because they want to look good and respect their partner and make that person go, aw. Now, we all do that sometimes. We all do that. But to teach people that that's the way to engage in a relationship is not healthy. And so we want to make sure that we're doing it for the right reason. You're opening the door because you're the one there and it's the nice thing to do. Makes sense. Yeah, that is. All righty. Before we say goodbye, is there any parting words of advice or, or maybe a favorite quote that you want to share? And then can you go ahead and give us your contact information and how we can connect with you? Well, thank you, Rebecca, for having me on. I appreciate it. You know, one of the major th lessons we want for anybody out there listening is, is if, if you, somebody says to you, well, why, wouldn't, why would I ask? 
One, does everybody deserve a choice? Yes. How do you give somebody a choice? You ask first. It's that easy. All right. And so that's one thing you want to leave this with is everybody deserves a choice. Why am I not giving my partner my choice or teaching my children to have that choice? And so anybody listening to this right now, if you're the parent, go home tonight to your partner and experiment with asking. Say, hey, can I give you a kiss? Your partners go, why are you asking all of a sudden? Because I want to hear that you want to be kissed. It feels wonderful to hear that. And I want to give you a choice. You deserve that. It's a shame that I've been assuming what you want. You know, if somebody listening, you might also ask, what do you really enjoy that I do? Or what do you not enjoy? You know, by learning how to ask these questions, you really empower the importance of consent and respect together. For contacting us, for anybody out there, we have a website, datesafeproject.org. So you're going to go on a date and you want to feel safe. So you turn to our project to help you through that, datesafeproject.org. And it is for all ages. We have a whole section there for parents. And we have a Facebook page you can like on there. We're at facebook.com slash datesafe. We're on Twitter at, at datesafe project. We're at, at uh, YouTube at datesafe project. So it's very easy to find us online. Our website is the easiest, especially to find our books and our DVDs for parents. That would be datesafeproject.org. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I have learned quite a bit. And like you said, even if you're married, asking actually might increase some communication and a better understanding in our relationship. So I appreciate your advice. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Mike and the Date Safe Project, please go to our website, theluminousmind.net. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Google+. Get our audio content by subscribing to iTunes and YouTube. Please leave us a review, tell your friends about us, and help us to continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 